welcome uh, Melos Kaus uh, to our weekly uh, departmental wide uh, journal club. Uh, Manolos is a professor of computer science at MIT. He is uh, the head of the MIT Computational Biology Group. He is an institute member of the uh, Broad Institute. He's a principal investigator of CSAIL and um, has done a lot of very interesting work in whether genomics, uh, epigenomics, a variety of complex diseases from obesity to um, Alzheimer's. And uh, I'm really, uh, and I think one of the uh, intellectuals of our community. And I'm really pleased that uh, he is, was willing to come and speak with us for this hour. Um, the only other claim to fame he has is he has probably received more uh, scrutiny from Lior Pachter than anyone else I know in uh, the world. So that is a unique uh, privilege. And maybe one day you'll explain to me or us why that is. People, uh, but people always ask me, are nature papers really that flawed? Because there's so many mistakes that are constantly pointed out. I'm like, no, no, no. They're simply that scrutinized. So yes. I can assure you that if there was the slightest mistake in any other paper, this would have been front and center of his blog. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. I, I've, had, I've had people come to me and say, um, so Jason Ernst was basically saying, yeah, one of his former students was basically telling me, you know what? Your papers are really good. He's really been trying to find something. <laughs> anyway, yeah. it, it's a privilege, uh, but uh, certainly not a pleasure. Let's put it. Let's yes, uh, exactly. <laughs> All right. So, without further ado, uh, I want to uh, start by introducing Carlos Borch. So, uh, Carlos, can you uh, wave your hand? And then uh, Brad Rosica. Um, so, Carlos is, um, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but final year student. Uh, so he might be looking for postdocs and hopefully a faculty job soon. So if you guys are looking for an immensely talented person, he uh, will be on the market soon. So he has, uh, you know, just an in immense productivity. And that's the, he, one, of, one of his many works is what I'm going to be presenting first. And then uh, Brad Ruzica is uh, a junior faculty member over at McLean Hospital. And he has his own group, but I'm also uh, on uh, his K award. So... We've been collaborating closely uh, with uh, both Brad and Shaheen Mohammadi and Jose Davila in my group uh, on the second paper that I'm going to be presenting. So let me <clears throat> start right away. So uh, the first is, uh, again, work that is 90% uh, led by Carlos with input from uh, Ben on the linking and Yongjin on the statistics and Vader on the DNA sites. And the goal for this was to really interpret GWAS. But to do, to do that, to basically look at how genome-wide association studies, um, you know, mechanistically can be interpreted, we uh, needed to do all of the steps in uh, the problem, which is basically integrate ENCODE, roadmap of genomics, uh, the genomics of gene regulation, basically construct this massive data set, then complete the data set computationally using Chrome Impute, and then lastly, uh, infer uh, circuitry and integrate it with GWAS in order to understand both regulation uh, and disease. And this is a bioarchive paper that, that was posted a year ago and hopefully will be appearing before the end of the year. So what is the goal? The goal is, as you all uh, care about, uh, um, understand the mechanism of disease. <clears throat> so the problems of genetics is to understand disease mechanisms, find new target genes, enable new therapeutics, enable precision medicine. And um, the challenge of that, however, is that when you look at a genome-wide association study, this Manhattan plot, when you open up the hood, these regions of association have mostly non-coding variants. And uh, in 93% of the cases, they simply lack any protein coding hit. That means we don't know the target gene, we don't know the causal variant, the cell type of action, the relevant pathways, the mechanism, which basically means we need to systematically understand the non-coding genome. And that's what this paper tries to achieve. So in our group, more broadly, what we're doing is integrating both common and rare variants with RNA and epigenomics in both healthy and disease samples, and then uh, integrate uh, all of the resulting data sets across uh, both, uh, you know, sometimes thousands of single cell data sets across millions of cells um, to predict driver genes, regions, and cell types, and ultimately validate the predictions in human cells and mouse models. So what we did in this paper that basically stands for epigenomic, um, you know, integration of multiple annotation projects or something like that, uh, so EpiMap, or <clears throat> basically the, the descendant, the, the, you know, the follower of roadmap, uh, the epigenomics roadmap, um, is to 
uh, integrate about 3,000 genome-wide uh, data sets, impute computationally another 14,000 data sets, and then um, integrate all this with annotations of enhancers and chromatin states using the high-resolution DNAs sites and using the imputed K27 acetylation signal to basically predict 2.1 million active enhancer elements, which we then cluster into uh, activity patterns of 300 modules, which we then use to predict downstream target genes and gene ontology terms on, you know, following each of these biosamples, and then the upstream regulators corresponding to that. And then lastly, uh, we integrate all of these with genome-wide association studies to predict the tissues and the targets and to do fine mapping, and ultimately to um, infer the global relationship between key issues and traits. So we've generated this massive resource for epigenomic data across 833 reference epigenomes. And this is already being utilized by many groups even well before publication. We've now uh, predicted the biological modules within which these enhancers are functioning, the downstream gene ontology terms that they're enriched in, and the regulatory motifs that they contain giving us hints as to who, who are the upstream regulators. And using all of that with GWAS, we now can look at any Manhattan plot kind of result of here's a region of association with, uh, you know, say coronary artery disease. And we can start linking these regions to their target genes, predicting what tissue they're acting in, and then predicting who are the upstream regulators that control them. So it's effectively a disease circuitry dissection kind of data set. So here's a quick overview of the biosamples. We have this huge diversity of uh, different tissues. And then across different projects in the row above, across different types of evidence, tissues, cell lines, primary cells, in vitro differentiated cells, across male and female uh, samples, and in different life stages. We basically use this methodology that we had previously developed with Jason Ernst to impute uh, missing data by looking at correlations between marks and also between samples. And this is what imputed data looks like in red. And this is what the observed hidden data looks like used as validation in gray. And you can see this dramatic resemblance. And indeed, we see this at multiple resolutions and across thousands of sites uh, across the genome. When we don't impute something well, uh, when there's disagreement between observed and imputed, it turns out that it's not the imputation's fault. It actually flags low quality data sets. So we can see that the data sets that show the, the lowest agreement in red are in fact that show the ones that show the lowest strand cross correlation, uh, both normalized and absolute. And we've also experimentally validated many of these imputed data sets by using a held out experimental data set that was only generated after all of this uh, imputation was done. And what we can see is that we surpass even the best possible predictor that you could get by choosing after the fact, the closest data set, 96% of the time for punctate marks and 100% of the time for um, the, a predictor that's based on the mean observed data. Anyway, a lot of technical validation to show that indeed the imputation is performing uh, outstandingly well. So we can now use that to understand the cross-sample relationships, the mark-specific clustering across stages and tissues to, to see how the samples relate to each other using active marks or repressive marks and any other mark, transcription marks and so on and so forth. And what we're seeing is that active marks differentiate things across different lineages, but repressive marks differentiate things across different stages of differentiation, which is uh, you know, kind of interesting. This is the tree of the samples that we obtain when we cluster them in an unbiased fashion. And you can see the organization follows a lot of the annotation, uh, grouping together, for example, embryonic uh, samples across different lineages, grouping together you know, many different samples of the same lineage and so on and so forth. So what we can do next is uh, use these to infer a reference chromatin state annotation of the human genome where you can uh, look, this is the roadmap of genomics project across 127 data sets. This is now Epimap across 833 data sets. And you can see here how they group. And um, there's also this Epilogos tool that we developed with Vader Milliman, uh, who was a former postdoc in, in, in our group, now a group leader over at Altius Institute. 
Um, and he's also applying for jobs, I think. So uh, if you guys are looking for an awesome computational biologist, Wouter Melleman, uh, take note. Um, so he's basically now able to look at the information content of every location in the genome in order to be able to focus on important regions. So anyway, I, I encourage you to explore all this. So what did we actually do with all these data? We basically clustered it to look at what are- Can I the... stop here? Oh yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. I'm getting private messages. And uh, so let me uh, start uh, paraphrasing uh, yeah. several of the questions. Okay, so one question is that uh, 2 million enhancers is a big number, and there probably are that many enhancers, but at the same time, um, these enhancers are sometimes highly tissue specific. Yeah. And in fact, often are. Yeah. And so um, you have a small sampling of tissues there, but it, it's, and I, it's easy to believe that you've outperformed the existing uh, predictive models uh, for enhancers but it could still be that you have an extremely low positive predictive rate, um, even so. So, so uh, basically there's many questions. Uh, one question is how many enhancers are real? Another question is how many enhancers are active in any one tissue? And another question is, are we done? So let me address all of them. So in sure. terms of are they real, we basically done, uh, an immense number of analysis to look at uh, motif enrichment, to look at uh, agreement between different data sets, to look for uh, enrichment in Go categories nearby, and so on and so forth. So um, they are as high quality as any other enhancer data set. So basically, for any of these metrics, you cannot tell apart the uh, set of enhancers here from the set of enhancers there. So the challenge, of course, is, you know, until uh, we've gone in and painstakingly validated every single one of them, we won't know whether they're real or not. But what we can do is use statistical measures at the group level, basically see, you know, which ones uh, validate or not. So that's the first question. The second question is, we find that about 15, 13% of the genome is covered across the entire set of enhancers. So the 2.1 million enhancers cover only 13% of the genome. But in any one cell type, it's less than 2% of the genome. But, but uh, Carlos, maybe I'm remembering these numbers wrong. Can you uh, correct me? I think that the numbers are something like, well, uh, you might even have them on that slide that you had for Prometrium M. Um, something like 1% of the genome for each of the specific samples is covered by enhancers specifically. Yeah. Um, and if you look at the modules as well, we find that about 250,000 of these are pretty constitutive, or at least kind of in very broad lineages. Um, yeah, so that that does kind of yeah. give you an intuition of the coverage. And if you go back to the figure with the modules or maybe forward, what you can see is at the very, it, I think it was forward actually, at the very top what we've done is have a breakdown of the bar. And here it gives you a sense of the activity patterns and what percentage of these enhancers. So you can see about 250 of them are in the gray patterns at the very beginning that have a, a broad pattern of activity across many different samples, whereas many of these are actually um, quite rare. So you can see here how this band expands, for example, for immune cells, there's a lot of enhancers there. And for these uh, globally active enhancers, there's also a lot of enhancers there. And then it compresses for others. So that, you know, that gives you a sense. And then the last question is, are we saturating? And the little uh, diagram that I showed earlier is basically saying that, um, if you look at the number of samples, it kind of increases for a while. And then we're kind of in the plateau now of, uh, and I think I had drawn it a little more accurately before. It's sort of more, you know, anyway, along these lines. Um, so um, yes, with more samples, you will continue, uh, you know, probably catching new enhancers. But right now we have a pretty good um, handle of uh, um, all of the major lineages, both adult and embryonic. So. I don't expect this number of 2.1 million to sort of continue to increase dramatically. Something okay, that I would so add. Those are, those are great answers and actually very reassuring. And, and I understand this is a work in progress. So it's there's no uh, demerits, at least in my perspective, that the answer is not yet. Uh, but um, have you looked at any uh, dependency on um, uh, ethnic background or geographic uh, content of origin for any of these? 
So it's, it's a great question. We haven't. Um, I wish I could say more, but uh, we, we need more diverse samples. I mean, there's been both immense agreement, but also examples of disagreement between different ethnic backgrounds in the epigenomic annotations from the literature. It's not something that our group has studied directly, but it's definitely something that uh, as you start thinking about the space that we're exploring, you can basically think about all of the different dimensions along which yeah. Uh, you know, you can expand. And one dimension is tissues, and that's the dimension that we've mostly focused on. Another dimension right. is inter-individual variation, including ethnic uh, differences and, you know, sort of uh, different continents, Asian, African, and, and so on and so forth. And I, I expect that that will be, you know, by far the largest source of inter-individual variation, uh, mm -hmm. but a tiny fraction of the variation that we see across tissues. So basically, you know, the inter-individual variation is a tiny component of the inter tissue variation. Then there's the developmental so, stage axis. And then there's also the disease axis where, you know, sort of in particular physiological conditions, uh, the samples might actually be different. Then there's the age component of different life stage uh, as people age their epigenome changes. And then there's the uh, environmental condition. So basically after you have a giant burrito, you're, you know, <laughs> Uh, the, the cells of your stomach probably change their epigenome and so on and so forth. So this is, you know, sort of the, the dimensions of, along which I expect to see this type of variation. Um, and, and, you know, if you look at the order, I would say number one, tissue, number two, uh, cell type, uh, you know, number three, developmental stage, number four, disease, number five, ethnicity, number six, inter-individual variation would be my guess for how these are gonna pan out, but it's clearly something that- I think, those are, I think those are very reasonable guesses and I would probably order them the same way, but I do wanna point out that you'll probably, there's an opportunity for you for, for funding, NIH funding to enlarge it now in the ethnicity. There's gonna be a lot of grants yeah. uh, and a lot yeah. of interest in, in enlarging it that way. So you just might be able to expand your space in several directions using And for methods. those in the call who are interested in doing that, we'd love to collaborate. So <laughs> all right. Reach out. Great. Okay. So that so, uh, be... oh sorry. No, I'm just gonna let bring it back to you, but I'm telling everybody I'm keep on looking at the chat. Some people so far everybody's using private uh, chat messages to me, but you can feel free to message everyone any questions and I'll interrupt Manolis as I have. Thank you Manolis. Sorry for the interruption back to you. Yep. Um, okay, so this is basically the landscape of uh, these enhancers, 2.1 million enhancers. Here's that how they group. And now we're going to start studying the modules in which they fall. So every one of those 300 columns is a different module of activity. And you can see here that even though we call these immune modules, there's a lot of variation between them. And there's an immense amount of diversity in the activity patterns of those. And for any one of those boxes, you now have thousands of enhancers that are co-active. So we can now ask for every one of these groups of a thousand enhancer, what are their properties? The first thing that we can do is look at what are the genes nearby enriched in, in terms of functional categories. So we can take any one of those columns, look at all of the enhancers in that column that are active in all these different tissues as you look at this column, and then ask what are the downstream target genes enriched in. And what you can see is extremely reassuring that if you look at the same columns from the previous slide, they're enriched in biological processes that are making a lot of sense within this, again, giving us uh, confidence about the uh, biological relevance of those. And then the other thing you can do is for the same column, not look downstream, but now look at upstream, who are the controllers of these modules and look for enriched regulatory motifs within these enhancers. And that's what we see here. We basically see a group of 86 different motif families these within them contain, of course, many exemplars of motifs that are annotated in slightly different ways, but they're grouped here into families. And you see these 86 enriched families. There are some that are extremely tissue specific in their enrichment, but there are others that are quite broad in their enrichment that are basically acting perhaps as global regulators that are cooperating with the local regulators of each of those cell types. So we can now look at some of those examples. If you look at heart, you can see the specific combinations of motifs, uh, immune cells, uh, brain, and so on and so forth. And you can start painting the set of regulators that control each of those enhancers. And then we can start using this information, using the fact that the downstream genes are actually enriched in common gene ontology terms. 
to basically say, well, among these three uh, genes that are nearby, one of them actually falls within an enriched gene ontology term. Perhaps this should be the real target. And you can use that as validation for different approaches for linking. So now what we're going to do is link together enhancers with putative target genes, individual putative target genes based on correlation. And we're going to validate this using gene ontology concordance as one of the metrics for uh, enrich for, for confirmation, but also using additional metrics. So that's the goal metric and using additional metrics based on CTCF, based on CRISPR perturbations, based on EQTLs from GTEx and Javadis, based on high C data of the folding of the genome and so on and so forth. And using all of these different metrics, we've basically now developed a method for linking that is shown here in blue based on correlation, based on correlation and distance and so on and so forth. And you can see here that these metrics uh, are, that, that these new linking methodology using this um, six marks distance and enhancer state annotations and this correlation based metric is in fact outperforming all previous uh, methods for linking using the vast majority of these uh, scores. So we can now start arguing about what are the links of the genome, how many genes are there for, how many target genes per enhancer, and it's only one to five target genes per enhancer. There's um, the average enhancer gene listen, uh, distance is about 90 kV. Uh, every uh, link is active in fewer groups than even the enhancers are active. You can have up to 30 enhancers per gene um, and so on and so forth. So we can now start studying the properties of these links. Now, the last and the most important thing is disease. So we now went out to study what are the genome, the, sorry, the GWAS enrichments for each of these enhancers. So we take every single <clears throat> reference epigenome and look at all of the active enhancers in that reference epigenome, and that's the columns. And then we, we take uh, 245 GWAS studies, and these are the rows. So the columns give us epigenomic locations above the axis here, and then the rows give us SNPs that are, annotate, that are associated with these traits, uh, the blue dots below the line. And every single time you see a, a red dot, that's when this, the enhancers active in that tissue are enriched in the genetic variants associated with that trait. And you see this dramatic enrichment. We basically have 30,000 enhancers and 30,000 SNPs that sit in enriched enhancers. So that allows us to now start annotating systematically what are the likely driver variants that sit within these enriched annotations. And so this is uh, just for my clarification. So this is SNPs that are not in, in LD, but actually right on top of the uh, putative enhancer. Absolutely correct. So basically yeah, we- For we methodological, for method, sorry for interrupting, Manolis, for methodological clarification, these are SNPs from the GWAS catalog that we yeah. pruned. Um, and then take any SNP within 2.5 kV of a center of enhancer. So a lot of methods that do something like this used to do things like within 10 kB or so. 2.5 kB is still not uh, as close as it could be. We have done the math and I think about 25% of these are actually within 100 base pairs of the center of the enhancer. So I would say maybe 25 are like very closely fine mapped, but most of them are within a very tight region of LD. So that, that, that's very helpful. So uh, could you educate me? I, I promise to read the, the paper eventually. What is across 2 million um, uh, enhancers, what's the range, what, what two standard deviations, within what two standard deviations, what's the range of the size of these, of these uh, enhancers? Oh, the enhancers? What? Yeah, the regions are based on DHS regions, which are very, uh, very high resolution because they're based on a separate study by one of the co-authors. And these are about 200 base pairs in width and almost exactly on a, as a median around 200 base pairs. There are very, very few that are past 300. So there, there's a very tight distribution. Basically. To answer your so, question, Zach, uh, these are already extremely narrow. So we've basically taken what could be a broad signal of epigenomics and we've narrowed it down to just the DNA's site. So this is still an impressive thing, but just to be meticulous, what it's saying is, and I understand that uh, Carl's made it very clear that it's uh, 10 KB is, is much worse than 2.5 KB is what you have, 
but some fraction of them will not be actually on top of them, but some important fraction, maybe 25%, will be literally on top of the motif. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly and, it. And I think we have a figure to that extent in the, hopefully in the final paper we'll have pretty soon. And, and just to dive into some examples, you can basically go to the website and browse all 30,000 of those that I mentioned. You basically select your favorite GWAS, you, you basically get back a list of what are all of the GWAS loci going down the list. And some of them don't overlap enhancers. You can see that some of them, the columns are white, but some of them do. And the ones that do, you can see that in order of what is the most enriched annotation, for example, for breast cancer as a GWAS, breast cancer lines are the most enriched. And now you can ask for the top locus, what is the distance between the SNP and the enhancer center. And here it's 30 nucleotides. Here it's 120 nucleotides. Here it's 40 nucleotides. Here it's 350 nucleotides. Here it's 1.3 KB, 1.2 KB and so on and so forth. Does that make sense, Zach? It does, very helpful, thank you. And then for every one of those, you can click and then see the linking and you can see what are the SNPs, how are they overlapping these enhancers and what are the target genes to which they are linked. And we have about 30,000 of those pictures. So <clears throat> the other realization is that there's a small number of uh, GWAS traits that are enriched extremely broadly. And these we call polyfactorial. These are the great uh, ones here. And these include, you know, heel bone mineral density, monocyte counts, red cell distribution, lung function, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then these are extremely broadly enriched. If you look at others, uh, like here, you basically have all of these, uh, you know, immune associated, both with autoimmune and immune response. And you see, you know, this column here associated with liver, you see these cholesterol traits and so on and so forth. So I really encourage you to browse these. They're a lot of fun and uh, you, you know, you, you can get a lot of insight from these traits. And here's some so examples. Manolo, I, you, 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 you did a great job as a great presenter to say at the beginning what you were gonna talk about and in fact, you said that you could browse it, but I've totally forgotten what the site was. So what, where can we browse this? Compbio.mit.edu slash epimac. All right, thank you. And you guys are all gonna crash. Okay. <laughs> all right. It, it can't handle massive traffic yet. We're working on that, but uh, right. super easy. Okay, so um, here's some examples. One of them looking at breast cancer, indeed linked to a breast cancer relevant gene and enriched in you know, breast cancer cell lines. Another one on schizophrenia, where you see this midfrontal area, for example, is the top uh, en en enhancer enrichment genome-wide. And you can see the broad number of SNPs that are together linked all to the same gene, a calcium uh, you know, uh, tr transporter, which basically, again, makes a lot of sense. Um, this is the global uh, uh, enrichment for different annotations in the pie charts that are associated with different traits in the names. So if you look at coronary artery disease, you see a pie chart here that corresponds to the set of tissues that is associated with that. And we can, of course, construct a network that allows you to just very naturally browse, uh, sort of, if you look at the genetic variants associated with schizophrenia and, you know, neuroticism and a lot of psychiatric traits, or with self-reported uh, math performance and so on and so forth, you see that they localize in enhancers that are active in the brain. By contrast, if you look at Alzheimer's, it doesn't localize in the brain. Instead, it localizes in immune cells, presumably through actually in microglia. If you look at it, it's called filtration traits. They localize in the kidney. If you look at cholesterol, they localize in liver and so on and so forth. But now we can take these traits, such as coronary artery disease, and say, why is it so polyfactorial? Why are there so many different tissues that are enriched in it? And what we can do is actually very cool we can actually start partitioning the set of SNPs that are associated with coronary artery disease in the subset of SNPs that overlap liver enhancers, the subset that overlap coronary artery uh, enhancers, the subset that overlap you know, adipose enhancers and so on and so forth. And what's really interesting is that when you do that, that subset enriches in a very different set of functional categories and uh, then the subset that overlaps coronary artery. And moreover, if you look at the um, co-associations of those SNPs, they also get partitioned into different comorbidity traits. 
So that basically says that we can actually take complex traits and partition them out into their parts and start understanding each of these parts separately. And that's true globally, but that's true also at individual loci. So for example, with coronary artery disease, you can see this locus here, which is you know, enriched in, for example, liver only, number one, in PCSK9, you guys have probably heard about that gene, uh, EDNRA for heart uh, only, and then you have PLPP3, which is actually enriched uh, in, which is actually associated with enhancers that are both active in liver and in coronary arteries, suggesting pleiotropy even at the locus level. So anyway, that's where I want to wrap the first one because it's already 435 and you can just go and browse. There's a lot of information. And uh, again, this is primarily the work of Carlos uh, with a super awesome collaboration with many other members of the lab. And it's part of ENCODE roadmap and GGR. All right, that's where I'll stop for the first one. Oh, I see so some- So that's questions. very, very impressive. Um, anybody have questions at this point? If not, we're gonna okay. move on to the next one. Beautiful. So I'm going to